election and several states are still counting ballots. How the numbers look for each candidate and where is the balance of power now for both the House and the Senate? The Biden campaign is setting the stage for a primetime speech. I'm Camila Bernal in Wilmington, Delaware, and coming up why, despite the preparations, this race is too close to call. U.S. COVID cases are soaring, but here in Bear County, the numbers seem to be staying relatively steady. But what could be next, and could we see the return of more restrictions? Here we go into the weekend. I'll help you prepare weather-wise, and we're on the lookout for some much-needed rainfall. I'll let you know what the odds of that are, especially with our next cold front coming right up. And we're live from Bernie for the battle for the district lead between the Alamo Heights Mules and the champion Chargers. The News at 5 starts right now. And first at 5, it's as simple as this. They are still counting. It's the latest update. Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Kellinan provided just a few moments ago. This as we're now three days after the election. During the press conference, Kellinan said that they sent out 8,500 military ballots. They've only received about 4,000 back. However, she says it should not change the election results here. As for the delay in final vote tallies, the election department still looking through 1,884 provisional ballots. So the staff has to go through each one of those to see if the person was registered, if their application got here too late, if they were in another county. There's a lot of work that they have to do. Officials plan to have the final vote totals by November 16th. They also said to show their appreciation for election judges, all will be given a free COVID-19 test next week. Meantime, the margins are narrowing as we continue tracking the presidential election nationwide. Three days after the polls close, the ballot counting continues. And today, former Vice President Joe Biden remains in the lead. If you've been tracking the election with us, we've decided to change how we're reporting the current totals in the electoral votes. Previously, we've been reporting numbers from the Associated Press, but because Arizona is still counting ballots, We've decided to remove its electoral votes from our count because that race is still too close to call. That puts Biden at 253 electoral votes and President Trump at 214. And in order to claim victory, a candidate must claim 270 electoral votes. Among the battleground states still counting, Arizona, Nevada, North Carolina, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. Alaska's three electoral votes are also still undecided at this hour. And taking a look at each candidate's pathway to victory, Joe Biden must claim two of the four battleground states you see on the screen or the state of Pennsylvania in order to win the election. President Trump, meantime, needs three of those battleground states and Pennsylvania to claim a victory. So let's take a deeper look now at where the candidates stand in each of these battleground states. First, Arizona. Joe Biden is leading here by about 39,400 votes. That has been narrowing throughout the day. Joe Biden also has a 14,000 vote lead in Pennsylvania. He first took the lead in this state early this morning. Let's move to Georgia right now. And Vice President Biden leading by about 1,500 votes. Actually, this is updated now. The difference is 1, 000, excuse me, 4,155 votes. His lead is growing there slightly. But because it's so close, the state has announced it will be holding a recount. And finally, the state of Nevada. Biden is up by about 20,000 votes, 20,137. That's also a lead that's continued to grow throughout the day. President Trump, however, is leading in the state of North Carolina by about 76,000 votes. Taking a look at the balance of power in Congress, which also hangs in the balance, literally. In the U.S. Senate, Democrats are at 46 seats. Republicans are at 48 seats. A party needs 51 seats in order to hold the majority in the Senate. And over in the House, Democrats are holding 212 seats. Republicans, 194. Whichever party claims 218 of the 435 seats wins the majority. We are continuing to monitor all these numbers throughout the newscast. We're going to be checking in with Camila Bernal in Wilmington, Delaware in just a bit. But first, some other news in Bear County.
Yeah, votes aren't the only things rolling in across the country. The United States is hitting new highs for daily COVID-19 cases. That's according to Johns Hopkins University. Almost 122,000 new cases were reported, reported in the U.S. just yesterday. That's here, a new record. Yes, here in Bear County, we have seen a slight rise in cases, but nothing like that nationwide spike. Garrett Berger tells us, though, what could be coming. To the head of STRAC, the current state of the pandemic could be a lot worse. I'm cautiously optimistic. I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. Our numbers are steady. Bear County has seen a slight rise in cases. Since October 28th, the seven-day average for new cases has mostly been above 200. A market hadn't hit since mid-August on the back end of the summer wave. But you need only look at places like El Paso to see what things could be. The West Texas County is seeing a surge in cases, 1,300 new ones just today and it's sending patients to hospitals in other counties, including here, where they're also included in the hospitalization numbers. I don't want to call it whack-a-mole, but it feels a little bit like different parts of the state at any given time, we're going to see rises and dips uh, for the rest of the, of the winter and into the early spring. Epley believes if a spike starts in Bear County, it won't be as severe as the one this summer, but flu and RSV season could add to the stress. And so those upper respiratory, you know, um, that, that drives uh, a lot of admissions to the hospital as well. Judge Nelson Wolf recently allowed bars to open up again. He said if things do change, they'll see if it's necessary to roll that back. But he also noted it would only affect a small number of bars that hadn't previously found a way to meet TABC guidelines to reopen. We will see if it's necessary to, to roll that back. But you got to remember, 2,000 are going to be open regardless if we roll back the little small ones. As for the other restrictions on what can be open or not, Wolf says that's in the governor's hands. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Continuing our coverage on the race for the White House now, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden taking the lead as his numbers in key battleground states continue to grow. But President Donald Trump won't go down without a fight, making it clear that he will contest this election. Camila Bernal is live with the latest from Wilmington, Delaware. Camila. Hey, Steve. So the Biden campaign, I think, was hoping to have a little bit more clarity at this point in the night. They scheduled a prime time address, but it's still unclear what will happen if that time approaches and there is still no results, no key states called one way or another. So we're waiting to hear what exactly the Biden campaign is going to do. In the meantime, President Trump is focused on those lawsuits. There are leaders all around the country who are asking the president to show them the evidence if there is any of fraud. But you're also hearing from both Republicans and Democrats that all of the votes need to be counted. The race to the White House is nearing the finish line. South Dakota! South Dakota! As the number of uncounted ballots has dwindled, Democratic nominee Joe Biden is within striking distance of the 270 electoral votes needed to take the presidency. Now leading in the critical battleground state of Pennsylvania, while protests continue on both sides. We the people know what's going on in this country. We know that this is a plot. This is a coup against President Trump. Trump's team made it clear they will contest the election. In a statement Friday, Trump saying, we will pursue this process through every aspect of the law to guarantee the American people have confidence in our government. I will never give up fighting for you and our nation. Meanwhile, Biden's campaign said this, the American people will decide this election and the United States government is perfectly capable of escorting trespassers out of the White House. Also today, the vote counts continue in key states, delayed by a record flood of mail-in ballots. While some, including the president, continue to spew baseless claims of fraud, claims for which his team has not produced one iota of evidence, what we have seen here in Philadelphia is democracy, pure and simple. Now, recounts and lawsuits are normal. They're part of the U.S. election, but they are likely going to be very expensive. Steve. Camilla Bernal live in Wilmington, Delaware. Thank you, Camilla. Do you want to keep track of what's going on in the remaining battleground states? Well, KSET.com's got you covered. We have up-to-date reporting on totals in those five states and a breakdown of what each candidate needs to win. You can find all of the information right now. It's on our website, KSAT.com.
And while we are still wrapping up the 2020 general election, one local activist has his mindset on next year. Farrell Clark announcing today he will be running for San Antonio City Council District 2 in May of 2021. That district currently held by Jada Andrew Sullivan, who was elected last year. Clark became highly involved in the Black Lives Matter movement over the summer. He's worked directly with the city council on changes the community wants to see. Clark plans to formally announce his run for office tonight at Tanks Pizza on North New Braunfels. The city's general election, by the way, is May 1st of 2021. New at five, he stabbed a man, destroyed the evidence and tried to get away. But San Marcos police caught up with him and those are their allegations. Now 21 year old Jonathan Luna facing several charges, according to San Marcos police. It happened Wednesday during a custody exchange between Luna, his child's mother and her new boyfriend. They say during an altercation, Luna stabbed the man, then left the scene. When officers caught up with him, he claimed he did it with a set of keys. Investigators say video surveillance caught him using a knife in which they believe he got rid of. He's now charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, family violence and tampering with evidence. The 20 year old victim taken to the hospital. No update on his condition. A man shot in the leg and San Antonio police are still trying to figure out why this happened. It happened this morning at San Pedro Springs Park on North Flores and West Myrtle. Officers say it, it happened at a park bathroom, but they aren't really sure of why the man was shot or who did it. He was taken to the hospital and at last check he had not given officers any information. A heavy fog said to be the cause of a deadly crash in Wilson County. It happened around 7 this morning along Highway 87. DPS troopers say the 17 year old driver had just pulled out of her driveway, was turning left on Highway 87 when another driver slammed into her truck, flipping it on its side. The teen died at the scene. The other driver also injured. She was taken to a hospital at Floresville. Investigators say heavy fog may be to blame. However, they're still investigating this one. And a Northside ISD bus driver also involved in a crash this morning. This one happened around nine near Babcock Road and Hamilton Wolf. And ISD says only one student and driver were on the bus. The student wasn't injured and was taken on to school. The driver, though, was taken to a medical clinic as a precaution. And that morning fog and resultant low cloud deck really took a while to lift and dissipate today. And then, then we were left with some fair weather patchy clouds this afternoon. Right now, a lot of sunshine out there. And, you know, we started the day at 55 degrees with that fog. And I think we're going to have another round of fog in a very similar morning. Uh, the next couple of mornings, really. 78, that was our high temperature today, just two degrees above average. Comfortable out there. 82 Eagle Pass in Del Rio. 81 in Panama Maria, but by and large, we're in the mid to upper 70s at this hour, especially according to our weather watchers in their backyards. Calm this evening, clear sky, temperatures mostly in the 60s, more fog tomorrow. We'll talk about the rest of the weekend and look at rain chances coming up. Ursula. Thank you, Adam. You might have seen people try it and maybe you've tried this yourself. We're talking about baking fresh bread. During the last few months, videos and tutorials have been flooding the internet and now there's machines out there to help you rise to the top of the bread making trend. We're going to tell you which ones are rated best next. New at five fresh baked bread with so much more time on your hands. It's actually become a thing and the sales of bread makers have soared nearly 500% in recent months. If you're looking to get on board 12 on your sides, Marilyn Moore shows us which ones rise to the occasion. Baking bread from scratch takes time and patience. Even the internet popular Dutch oven bread requires a lot of steps. So Carolyn Ramsey uses a bread machine for fresh baked goodness. With the bread machine, I just pop the ingredients in, select the settings, and then I can come back three or four hours later and everything's done for me. Bread makers have been around for years, but newer models are more versatile, turning out gluten-free bread and pizza dough, too. Just toss in the ingredients, set it, and forget it. At least that's what's supposed to happen. Consumer Reports tested bread machines using recipes that came with. 
The machines were scored on how easy they were to use, how noisy they were, and we also noted whether the bread loaves were evenly browned. Of the three tested, the $360 Zoshi Rushi Home Bakery Maestro was a standout. It features an automatic dispenser for adding nuts and fruit at the right time. For a lot less money, the Breadman two-pound professional bread maker makes nice loaves, but the display is small. And because of its convection fan, the Cuisinart two-pound convection bread maker was the noisiest and priciest. The controls are hard to see, and some loaves came out with streaks of unmixed ingredients. But it was the fastest, three hours and five minutes. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Three hours and five minutes to make bread? Yeah, you got to be patient, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's not so expensive at HEB, so yeah, <laughs> a little easier on my schedule. Yeah, yeah. I don't. You know, I'm I'm lucky if I can make hot dogs. So you know, <laughs> forget about the bread. Yeah, pop in the microwave, hit that 30 second fast button. Kids have learned that pretty quickly. <laughs> there you go. Especially during COVID. All right, let's talk about weather headlines. More foggy mornings ahead. It seems like fog has really been the norm, and I think it's just going to continue and actually thicken during parts of the weekend and early next week. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Temperatures back above average, and it looks like they're going to stay there for a while, despite a weak cold front that's going to hit us next week and rain chances along that front pretty slim and obviously we could use the rain. Take a look at our drought monitor. Yesterday we just looked at South Texas where of course you head to Uvalde and that's where we now have an exceptional drought. But let's look across the state, particularly West Texas needs the rainfall just like us. Almost half the state it considered in drought now, whereas three months ago, one third of the state was considered in drought. A sunny day across the Lone Star State today. Of course, we had the morning fog and resultant low clouds earlier today. But we broke out into a lot, lot of sunshine ever since. There is actually an active weather pattern that's taking shape, but it's in the western United States here. Plume of moisture coming off the Pacific, also a disturbance dropping in from the Pacific Northwest. See a little pre precipitation out there, desert southwest and all the way toward the Pacific Northwest. This pattern is going to persist for several days. Unfortunately, that disturbance just isn't going to drop our way and boost our rain chances anytime soon. So they'll have some plenty of moisture out there in your mountain west and they could use it too. It's just not going to translate here to South Texas for us. So I know I'm sorry. These rain chances are kind of depressing. You look at them and maybe a few morning sprinkles by Sunday even into Monday and even Tuesday morning isolated shower with that cold front on Tuesday, but that would be it. So let's talk temperatures compared to last week. This map is totally different. Actually, we had some record high temperatures the past couple of days across the northern tier of the United States. And it's not all that different in Chicago than it is here. I mean, 77 San Antonio, 81 in North Platte, Nebraska, 70 in Chicago and Del Rio's at 82 degrees. Alpine right now at 75. We have a mixture of 70s to low 80s across most of Texas. Catula at 82 as well. Let's talk about the dew point though. This is important. I know I've talked a lot about the deweys the past couple of days because dew point temperatures are in the 50s. And remember, the real definition of the dew point is the temperature the air must cool to in order to become saturated. Do you think our air temperature is going to drop into the mid 50s tonight? I think it's a good bet. So our air temperature is going to drop down to this dew point, meaning the air becomes saturated and well, it's likely to lead to another round of fog. I don't expect it to be quite as dense as earlier this morning, but I do anticipate a shallow layer of fog for a few hours around sunrise tomorrow across a good chunk of South Texas, and that'll likely reduce visibilities on the roadway. So if you have any early morning travel plans or even just an early morning bike ride, something to definitely keep in the back of your mind and be cautious of tomorrow morning. Double check the conditions before you head out. Otherwise, it's looking like a very sunny day. 55 in the morning, bright and sunny, 82 into the afternoon and a bit of dampness to start the day, but especially into Sunday. I think that low fog and especially drizzle is going to dominate the first part of our Sunday. Then we'll gradually eke out some sunshine by the afternoon, making it to 80 degrees. Same story Monday, Tuesday similar, but we'll have a little wind shift. I have a hard time referring to this one as even a weak cold front. It's just a wind shift. Technically it's a cold front, but it's not going to cause many big changes. We'll be back down to the lower 50s by Veterans Day morning. Thank you, Adam. All right, our big game takes us to Bernie and that's where our Greg Simmons is now live. Greg.
You know, and it's a beautiful night. The weather is perfect. Everybody is ready for this big battle for district lead in 15-5A Division II between the Alamo Heights and the championship chargers. Champion chargers, that is. When we come back, more about this big game. And UTSA has to postpone their game against Rice. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome live to Bernie for the big game and our big game covers. The Alamo Heights Mules taking on the number three champion Chargers for the lead in District 15-5A Division II. Now, the Mules come into this game with an unblemished district record of 2-0 after going 1-2 in non-district play. They've already defeated Floresville 28-17 and Medina Valley 30-0 in back-to-back -back victories. Seem to be hitting their stride under head coach Ron Riddiman in his first year at Alamo Heights. The Chargers come into this game with a 4-1 record, also 2-0 in district, coming off a big win over Kerrville Tidy last week, 27 to seven. Only would a victory for champions solidify their lead in district. It would even up the series at five Alex wins apiece. It's going to be a big week for us. We're coming off a big win against Medina Valley and uh, I think we have a lot of confidence and we really believe in ourselves and the new coaching staff. So I think I think we got a good chance. We know they have a big offensive line so that's going to be an area of focus. We know they they like to run a little more than they like to pass. Um, we know they'll be a good team and we'll have to bring our all. Here are some of the games we'll be covering tonight, including Alamo Heights champion here in Bernie. South Sand will visit Linoff to take on Clemens, Roosevelt and Johnson over Comalander, Reagan and Churchill at Heroes, Warren and Taft at Ferris, Harlan and Stevens at Gusterson, Jefferson and Edison at the Tommy Bowl at Alamo. Navarre and the Young Men's Leadership Academy has been canceled. Lockhart at Medina Valley and Casterville, Somerset Valley, the Honey Bowl. Tom Ball, Concordia Lutheran versus Antonio Farrar, Temple Central Texas against Holy Cross at Wheatley Heights. Randolph will be in Poteet and Central Catholic will be in Katy to take on St. John the 13th. Our big game coverage road trip has photographer Eddie Latigo making a trip down Highway 97 tonight, starting in Floresville. The Tigers host the Kerrville tie the Antlers. Then it's over to Pleasanton to catch the Eagles against the Bears of Laverne. And finally pulling into Charlotte, see what the Trojans can do with Bruni. The UTSA Roadrunners have had to postpone their game schedule for tomorrow against Rice due to COVID-19 concerns. Now, the Roadrunners had made it through eight straight games in a revamped schedule due to the coronavirus until it finally caught up with them today. They were scheduled to depart for Houston by bus today for tomorrow's game at 2.30 when UTSA Athletic Director Lisa Campos made the announcement. It is not clear whether the positive test came back on players or coaching staff, but we'll work with Conference USA on rescheduling the game. Don't forget to join us on Twitter, BGC.com tonight for all the latest scores, and then on the night beat at 10 for all the highlights live from Bernie Greg Simmons KSAT 12 sports tonight like tonight Greg with the weather that I'm envious of you out in perfect taking in football thank yeah, you yeah I'm thinking the same thing yeah. we'll be right back I'll let you know ABC will be holding another election special tonight the your voice your vote election 2020 it's a special edition of 2020 that'll air tonight from 7 until 9 it will then be followed by Shark Tank from 9 until 10. And then, of course, the night beat right here at 10 o'clock. All right, this weekend, some morning fog, especially on Sunday. A bit of drizzle then as well, but highs right around the 80-degree mark. So running a little above average. Thank you, Adam, and thank you for watching the News at 5 with us. See you back here at 6.